Hello, everybody. Welcome back to Altium Academy. I'm your host, Zach Peterson, and today we're going to be looking at routing over splits in power planes. Should you do it? We're gonna answer that question in this video. Now, Bert Simonovich recently put out a paper in Signal Integrity Journal that examined this, and I wanted to examine the same thing in Altium Designer and Symbior. What I'm gonna do in this video is show you how to set up a test board properly in order to do a simulation of this, and then we'll look at what happens when we actually route over a split between two large power rails with strip line routing. Make sure to hop into Altium Designer and follow along, and let's get started. Now the situation that we want to look at in this video involves strip line routing and it typically arises when you have six layer boards. Typically when you have a six layer board that's designed for high speed, you'll have signal on the top layer and then you'll have symmetric signal on the bottom layer. Then on layers two and layer five, you will typically have ground and then another layer with ground. Now, one of the reasons that you might use a six layer board is because one of your internal layers can also be SIG. So we have some signal routing in this layer, but then you can typically have a power layer here as well. Now, one thing that often happens in these situations with power layers is you may have two different rails, one routed with V1 and then the other routed with voltage V2. Now, as you're routing your signal layer around in this internal part of the stack up, you may end up routing over one of these splits in this power layer. Does this split actually matter? Well, that's the situation that we want to look at in this video, and we're going to run some simulations to determine whether or not it does actually matter. I think the intuition here is that because you have a ground plane above this signal layer, then the signal layer is still going to be strongly coupled to the ground plane, and you may expect that the impedance deviation here in this region, where you have the split between your power rails, might be negligible, and as a result, you can probably ignore this. Well, I think this is one of those things that requires some context. At certain frequencies, it may not matter, and at other frequencies, it might actually matter. So this is one of those things that you really should simulate. The reason is that because here in this region where you have the solid power plane, you have the impedance determined by layer two and layer four. And so you would then put layer two and layer four as your references into the impedance calculator, such as if you're using the layer stack manager in Altium Designer. However, in this region, your reference is no longer layer four. Your reference is actually layer two in this region, and then layer five down here. So you have slightly more distance from the signal to the bottom uh, reference layer, which could then create your impedance deviation. Will this actually matter? Well, it depends on the input impedance looking over this direction through the signal layer. Now, this is something that we can actually simulate in an electromagnetic simulator. And what we want to do is look at the S parameters. So since we're dealing with an input impedance deviation right here in this region, we would then want to calculate our S11 value for the traces that are being routed over this region. Now, another question that you might ask is, is there going to be a difference for single-ended signals versus differential signals. So for single-ended signals, the only reference you have are these plane layers above and below the signal layer. But if you have a differential signal, the differential signal can provide the return path and it functions as the reference for one of the other traces. So is that gonna produce a difference? We're gonna look at that situation as well. We'll look at single-ended S parameters and we'll look at differential as parameters when we do our simulation. Now, let's jump into Altium Designer. We'll take a look at how to set up a test board for this type of situation, and then we'll throw that into a simulator and we'll get our S parameters, and we'll see what the difference is between routing over solid power versus routing over split power. So now I'm inside of Altium Designer, and what I wanna do is show you how to set up a test board in order to accurately perform simulations for this power plane split. So here inside of Altium Designer, what I've done is just created kind of a simple model where I have two different sizes of gaps for our power plane split, and then I've created an identical set of interconnects over a solid uh, ground and power plane. Now, if we look at the stack up, you can see here where our power, ground, and signal planes are located. Here on the top and bottom layers, we have a uh, uniform ground. Here, layer two is our power layer. That's where our split is gonna be. 
And then layer three is our signal layer. So that's where our signals are being routed. In this example simulation model that I've created, I've placed two different size gaps. So here I have a 400 mil gap and here I have a 200 mil gap. And then if you look at the schematics here, I've defined single-ended and differential traces that we can use to simulate what happens for our different types of signals when they route over these gaps. Now on each end of these nets, what I've done is I've created these dummy components. And these dummy components are basically just a pad. That's gonna make it very easy to assign a port on each end of these interconnects when we then import this into the simulation tool. Now, one thing I'd like to do uh, before we jump into simulation is to just discuss these via transitions. Now, you can see here I've placed some stitching vias around these signal vias, and then you can see that there's kind of a default anti-pad around these signal vias. Depending on the frequency range that you're working in, you would actually want to design these vias so that they have a 50 ohm impedance specifically in the frequency range that you care about. For this demo, we're not gonna worry about that because that's a whole nother level of complexity. But in general, if you were gonna create a simulation model and whether you were gonna use ANSYS or use Symbior or some other simulator, you would wanna make sure that that via transition provides correct matching. If you can't do that, you would then need to relocate the pad for this port to an internal layer and eliminate those vias. Now, the other thing that you might wanna do, again, depending on the frequency range you're working in, is move the location of this split closer to your input port. So for lower frequencies, you can have this somewhat farther away, whereas at higher frequencies, you would want to move this gap closer to the input. So to do that is pretty simple. You're of course just dragging the gap here from these polygons closer to your input side. Then you would just size it so that you have the correct gap size. Here I'm gonna leave it here and just in the middle and we're gonna see what happens when we simulate the S parameters. We're gonna look at how the different size gaps influence our S parameters in different frequency ranges. For this set of simulations, we're gonna use Symbior. To get your board into Symbior, you would just do an ODB++ export, and then you can re-import the board back into Symbior and start selecting the nets that you wanna simulate. So now I've brought the board up in Symbior, and now I can start selecting the ports that I want to simulate. Here, when I'm in Symbior, what I can immediately do is just run an ERC, and I can see what the expected impedance deviation is along this section of interconnect. So you can see here for the differential pair with the 200 mil gap that we have a six ohm deviation in the differential impedance. Here, if we go back to the single-ended port and I run the same, you can see that I get an eight ohm deviation. So it's actually much more significant when you have the single-ended signal versus the differential signal. For the single-ended signal, it's a almost 20% deviation in the impedance, whereas it's only a 6% impedance for the differential pair. So that should underscore the importance of having differential pairs and sometimes having them spaced closer together. When they're closer together and you route over this kind of split, you're gonna have a smaller deviation in the differential impedance. That's because one trace always references the other trace. Next, let's start selecting our ports here and then we can set up a quick S parameter simulation. So here I'm gonna select our 200 mil gap, our 400 mil gap, and then our uniform plane. And I'm gonna run a fast SI simulation to get the S parameters. So now we have our return loss data pulled up and the return loss data pretty clearly shows what happens when you have that split in the plane, especially when it's a reasonably large split. Here, when we look at really low frequencies, we see that all the S parameters pretty much overlap with each other. And this is when we're sub 100 uh, megahertz or right around 100 megahertz. Once we start to get into the gigahertz range, we really start to see the deviation in the S parameters really quickly. Here, the blue curve is for S33, and that's for this middle trace right here. So that's where we have the uniform plane. Then here, the red is S11, so that is for our top left corner here. That's where we have our smaller gap. And then here, the brown or the orange curve, that is our trace down here in the lower right, which is our 400 mil gap. So this is where we start to see a pretty big deviation in the S parameters in the one to about seven or eight gigahertz range. And you can see here that we do get pretty high return loss compared to the trace over uniform planes. However, is this too much reflection? Well, as we can pretty clearly see in this case, the return loss does get pretty high, but it doesn't jump up above negative 10 dB. In a lot of cases, this would probably still be acceptable even if we're routing over these large gaps. 
Now, once you get around 10 gigahertz and higher frequencies, we see that the S parameters all start to overlap each other a little bit. So this is because the dominant return loss mechanism switches from the gap in the power plane to the loss or the impedance deviation that's created by the loss in these interconnects. Now, remember, in Ultium Designer, it's determining a lossless impedance, but the real interconnects have dielectric loss tangent as well as skin effect that create deviations in the impedance. And that's what's creating these reflections at much higher frequencies. So our conclusion is this, at really low frequencies, sub one gigahertz, you're really not gonna notice a difference. Once you get into the low gigahertz range, you do start to see a large difference. However, with the small spacing that we have between ground and signal, it doesn't create so much loss that the interconnect may not still be usable. Once we get to really high frequencies, the split in the plane becomes less important and you have other loss mechanisms that are creating the impedance deviation that you see in these S parameter plots. Now let's take a look at the differential S parameters for all of these differential pairs in this test board we have all of the differential S parameters prepared. Now, what you can see here is that all of the differential S parameters are pretty similar. We have the same ordering here for these curves by color. The gapless and the small gap and the large gap are all really similar all the way up to really high frequencies. This can be explained in a couple of ways. First of all, as we saw earlier, the impedance deviation when routing over that split in the power plane was smaller for the differential pairs. Remember, it was only 6%, whereas for the single-ended traces, it was almost 20%. Next, we have the same change in the dominance of the return loss from low to high frequencies as we had in the single-ended case. So just because we're in differential pairs doesn't mean that the loss tangent and the skin effect go away. They also will dominate and create an impedance deviation seen looking into the interconnect. And so that's what's creating this big deviation at higher frequencies and then creating this higher return loss rising just above negative 10 dB. So this channel would still be appropriate all the way up to about 20 gigahertz. But to really perfect this, we would wanna do what I stated earlier, both for the single-ended transition and the differential transition. And that would be to optimize these vias so that we get a really flat near 50 ohm single ended impedance or 100 ohm differential impedance within the bandwidth that we care about. That's gonna help eliminate some of this discrepancy and then it's gonna give us a little bit more accurate view into what's happening with our system. Now, as I've shown in some other videos, we really don't care about the via impedance until we get above a couple of gigahertz. So if we were only looking from, for example, uh, up to 2.5 gigahertz here, we could get a really clear view of what's going on in both sets of curves. Here, if we just zoom in to the 2.5 gigahertz range for our single-ended uh, traces, we see here the really big impedance deviation that we get when there's a gap versus no gap. And so it's, it's a little over 20 dB. For the differential pairs, we have a much smaller deviation between the return loss curves, so it's a little bit more difficult to conclude that the split in the power layer is the sole cause of all of this behavior. To really nail that down, we would definitely want to optimize those vias, or we could bypass the vias completely and just move those pads into the inner layer and then assign our port directly to those pads on the inner layer. Make sure to take a look at the blog that's linked in the description to learn more about this, and I'll discuss this further in that blog. Thanks for watching, everybody. Make sure to hit that subscribe button, hit that like button, leave your comments and questions in the comment section, and of course, don't forget to call your fabricator, folks. We'll see you next time.